Hi everybody, Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our last video on the connective tissues and we're going to focus on just the cartilages. Remember, I'm not going to discuss the bone tissues or the blood in any great detail in my whole video series on the connective tissues. I asked you to know the two names of the bone tissues and the three cell types we find in the bone tissues. And I gave you a little spiel on the blood in video B as well as video C. And whatever I discussed, the little bit I discussed uh, in both those videos is all you need to know for this class. In AMP2, you will learn in much more depth all the details that is about the blood. Remember, blood is our fourth connective tissue type. We finished discussing the biggest group, that is the connective tissue proper, with its loose and dense connective tissues. Our second group, made up of three types, is the cartilages. So here goes. So once again, quick reminder, we looked at all of the connective tissue proper tissues already in the previous video. So what we still need to do is look at our cartilages, these three guys. And I am going to go ahead and check off the bone tissues and the blood because we've done what we need to do for now for those tissues. The cartilages share one major feature with the epithelial tissues, and that is that they are also avascular. But what they do not share with the epithelial tissues is that they lack a nerve supply. Epithelial tissues do have a nerve supply. Think, for instance, of the Merkel discs um, that we discussed and the various little uh, nerve endings that um, we'll be pointing out in the integumentary system, as you'll see when we get to that. The main cell type that we see in the cartilages and that we do not find anywhere else are the chondroblasts that can further differentiate into the chondrocytes. So you're not going to find cartilage cells in any of the other tissue types, just like you're not going to find any bone cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteoclasts in any of the tissue, other connective tissue types. Now, there's something interesting about cartilage cells, whether they're chondroblasts, chondrocytes, and that is they always sit in a little well, in a little cup, and we refer to that as a lacuna, plural lacuni. So, for instance, if I just quickly sketch the tip of your nose here, right here, and I take out a little chunk right here, and I put that under the microscope, it wouldn't be a chunk, obviously, a little sliver, then we would see the nuclei of our cells with their cell membranes, but each one of these cells would sit in a little cup, kind of like so, or I'll draw one more separately to make it a little clearer, perhaps. That's our cell, that's our cartilage cell, and then it would have around it our lacuna, and I'll just stripe the lacuna like so. As a matter of fact, one way I often manage to identify the cartilages is because it's almost like little eyeballs are looking at you. Very characteristic, those lacuni helps you really figure out that you're looking at the cartilages. The matrix of the cartilages I've mentioned before is rich in something called chondroitin sulfates, which is why often people, in an attempt to fix the cartilage that's wearing out in their joints, uh, they supplement themselves with chondroitin uh, pills, perhaps, that you can buy over the counter. We also see in most of our cartilages lots of collagen fibers. So what about these other two terms, perichondrium and anti-angiogenesis factor? So let's come back to the tip of our nose. Because cartilages in our body are 
avascular, we're going to see that cartilages cannot get very thick or very big. You know, feel the tip of your nose, um, your ears, they're very thin really, right? And so somehow all of that cartilage tissue needs to be nourished and therefore they're going to be surrounded most often, not everywhere, it depends on the location, but let's say the tip of your nose for instance or the rings of cartilage in your trachea, they're going to be surrounded by a layer that we refer to as the perichondrium. So I'll circle perichondrium and put an arrow to it, right? I'll fill it in like so. And I purposely used the color red because it is made up of connective tissue that is vascularized. So it's going to be made up of dense irregular connective tissue and maybe even not so well vascularized dense regular. But there is enough vascularization in the perichondrium because um, of the dense irregular connective tissue. So the nutrients seep into the cartilage and therefore our cartilage cells in their lacunae can be nourished, right? So those nutrients are going to reach the cells and I assume that some of those nutrients can hang out in those little wells we call the lacunae as well. Finally, What's really interesting about cartilages is that they secrete a protein or they have the ability to make a protein called anti-angiogenesis factor. And so what is so exciting about that? Well, let's analyze that word. So anti means against, you know that. And genesis by now, I think you know too, means the creation of, creation of. Anti means against. And angio, think of when a person has to go get an angiogram. They need to have a map made, a photograph taken of the vessels of their heart. So angio means vessel, blood vessel in particular. So what does the whole word anti-angiogenesis mean? It means against the creation or against the making of blood vessels. So cartilages have the ability to produce something that prevents blood vessels from growing into the tissue. That's pretty amazing. Scientists have jumped on this. Why? Well, think of tumors. I don't know if you've ever looked at a picture of a tumor. You can probably look at, uh, you can probably Google tumor images. And, and what you'll see is that, and I'm just going to, uh, roughly sketch this, you know, if this is a, a tumor here somewhere in the body, that tumor will grow and draw towards it tons of blood vessels. So the tumor will produce all kinds of chemicals that will either attract the blood vessels or allow new blood vessels to grow. Well, if we can provide a patient who has tumors with something like an anti-angiogenesis factor, we could make it much more difficult for the cells in this tumor to survive. And that's exactly what is done these days. Plenty of cancer patients out there these days are, supplement, are provided, I should say, are prescribed anti-angiogenesis factor. So that's a nice little piece of clinical information for you guys. There are three different cartilages, and you see them listed here with pictures, which are not the best pictures in your book, but um, for now we can just focus on the sketches here on your left. So the most common cartilage is called hyaline cartilage. There will be a lot of ground substance that doesn't show any fibers, but fibers, especially collagen fibers, are actually present. So the collagen fibers are not very visible. 
this is a very abundant tissue. Uh, you find it wherever you can think of the, where there is cartilage. Um, that's probably hyaline cartilage, except for your ears. But the tip of your nose, the pieces of a cartilage in your trachea, uh, the cartilage in your rib cage, um, all hyaline cartilage. Then next in line, we have fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage. So both of those are much less common. Fibrocartilage is very similar to dense regular connective tissue. Once again, lots of collagen fibers that run parallel, that run very parallel, um, very much what we saw in the case of the dense regular connective tissue. I'll just put here like dense regular connective tissue. So don't confuse these two. It can be easily done. So what you need to do is pay attention to your cells. So the cells are going to have to sit in the lacuna. So here's your cell with its nucleus and then there's the little cup called the lacuna. The lacunae are not very clearly illustrated in this top picture, by the way. But here we are very nicely seeing our, I'll just use blue for the lacuna. And then we see the cell with its nucleus right here. So the moment you see lacunae and lots of parallel fibers, you're pretty sure you're looking at fibrocartilage. This is a cartilage that really deals a lot with shock absorption. So you're going to find it in between your vertebrae. You know, in between your vertebrae, you have these discs of cartilage that makes your spine kind of springy or prevents your vertebrae from, you know, crunching against one another. And uh, a good portion of those intervertebral discs, as they're called, are made up of fibrocartilage. Inter, remember that inter means in between. Where your two pubic bones meet, there we also find fibrocartilage. And then finally, we also have elastic cartilage. So we have hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, which is both of them are rich in collagen fibers. Hyaline cartilage, collagen fibers not visible, fibrocartilage. Collagen fibers, all very visible and run very parallel. Elastic cartilage, what do you think is present there? Not so much collagen fibers, but elastic fibers. So once again, we have to be careful that we pay attention to what kinds of cells are present. If we see lots of squiggly, dark colored fibers, but we see cells inside of lacunae, then we're dealing with elastic cartilage. For instance, your ears have a lot of elastic cartilage in them. Also your epiglottis. Your epiglottis is that little flap that closes off your windpipe, better called your trachea, to prevent food from entering in there when you swallow. So also the epiglottis. Okay. So we're going to go over each one of the cartilages briefly again with a text slide and a better picture. So as I mentioned, hyaline cartilage is extremely common. And if we compare, compare it to the other two cartilages, the fibers are not visible. It's a pretty firm yet still pliable type of cartilage. And I gave you a whole bunch of examples already that are listed here and another Example that I did not list is the fact that it's the most common um, part of our embryonic skeleton. And we will learn when we learn about the skeletal system that our bones primarily grow from hyaline cartilage structures. The epiphyseal plates, those are, that's a fancy way of referring to our growth plates in our bones. All of this makes more sense. Um, that is the fact that our bones arise from cartilage. All of that will make much more sense when we get to the skeletal system. Here we're looking at a low magnification of hyaline cartilage. 
which is typical about highland cartilage is the amount of ground substance that we see. No fibers visible, but they are present. The ground substance often looks kind of milky, foggy. And then we see our cartilage cells in their lacunae. Here we're looking at a, a much higher magnification and sometimes chondroblasts, two chondroblasts, uh, might be seen in a single lacuna because they're dividing perhaps right here. We see um, two chondroblasts in one lacuna. Um, here we see again two chondroblasts in one lacuna. Here we see one cell in a lacuna. Elastic cartilage is much more stretchy, and as the name says, it's going to not have so much collagen fibers. It's going to be very rich in those elastic fibers, and they often stain very dark to almost black. So here we're looking at a very high magnification of that flap that needs to close off your trachea when you begin the process of swallowing. You know, when you put food in your mouth and it enters your throat, that is a single tube in the back of your throat. Then your throat has to split up to form the esophagus, which takes the food to the stomach, and it splits up into the trachea, which carries air uh, down into your lungs. You know, you can breathe air through your mouth as well as your nose. Your nose is connected in the back with your mouth, as you know. So where that split occurs between the esophagus and the trachea, we need to have a little flap that prevents any food from entering into the trachea. When that flap doesn't work well, when that epiglottis doesn't work right, you know, food gets stuck in our trachea and we cough. So that trachea, I'm sorry, that epiglottis has to be uh, rather um, flexible and stretchy and springy and all that, and so it has elastic cartilage. So when we're looking at this slide, in the center here, that is where our cartilage is. And, and the cells are not showing their nuclei well, but you can see our lacuna and then the cell inside of it. The cells have kind of pulled away, but you know there's this very characteristic look for the cartilage cells in their lacuna. The fact that the matrix is so pitch black on the slide is indicative that we're looking at um, we're looking at uh, elastic fibers. So I'm just going to try to point so everywhere where it's really dark, assume that those are assume that that's the location of the elastic fibers. By the way, what we're seeing surrounding our cartilage right here, that's our perichondrium. That, that's our dense irregular to dense regular connective tissue that is vascularized and that nourishes our epiglottis. And we see it on this side as well. Finally, we get to the fibrocartilage, which, as I said, is specialized in shock absorption. We can do that because cartilages are rich in water. Lots and lots and lots of parallel arranged collagen fibers. And um, this is a common tissue in the intervertebral discs. The pubic symphysis is where your two pubic bones meet. That piece of cartilage is made up of fibrocartilage. It gets very stretchy when a mom is about to give birth. And we also see fibrocartilage in the menisci of our knees. The menisci are pads of that fibrocartilage, singular meniscus. Often athletes rupture these menisci or they fragment, creating all kinds of havoc in their knees. This is a very high magnification of a slide of fibrocartilage, plus I've, I blew it up for, uh, for you guys, and so we've lost some of its resolution. But still, you can clearly see that there are fibers here, and these things here are, of course, your lacunae with the, the cartilage cells inside, but why can't we distinguish this slide from a slide from dense regular connective tissue? 
Well, if this were dense regular connective tissue, true, it's true that we would see once again all these fibers really, really parallel to one another, all these collagen fibers, but there would be many fibroblasts, nuclei that would look just like little short, uh, you know, flattened spots like so in between the collagen fibers. And instead, we see rather roundish structures, which are those lacuni. So that, these guys here, these lacuni, tell you you're looking at cartilage. In addition, the parallel fibers tell you that you're looking at fibrocartilage. So phew, we've, we've finished up our connective tissues. We studied, in, to some extent, um, your six tissues that belong to the connective tissue proper group. Remember, we can divide them as loose or dense connective tissues. So the connective tissue proper group was the biggest. Then we had our three cartilages. And in the next one of the next chapters, we're going to start the skeletal system and therefore study those two bone tissues that you've already learned the names of in greater detail. And in AMP2, you'll learn even more about the blood. So there are four tissue groups, connective tissue proper, the cartilages, the bone tissues, and the blood. Thanks for watching. I hope these videos help you.